So, hi everybody. Uh, thanks to attend this session. Uh, I hope everybody uh, could enjoy some awesome wearful during the break. Uh, personally, I really did enjoy them. Uh, so, uh, it was your case as well. So, uh, this station will cover some uh, fairly new stuff that we are doing at DASTAX. Uh, most of you guys are familiar with Casanova, and most of you guys have different experience currently with uh, the drivers. Uh, most of the time we speak of, about some new features in Casanova, some new features uh, to improve some performance, to improve uh, developer experience on the server side, but we haven't talked that much over the past years of some real new stuff uh, on the driver side. Of course, there has been some improvement for some language. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, about uh, uh, Astyanax. That was a great uh, project for uh, the Java space. But still, I guess that most of us uh, customer users can feel something is missing. And that's actually what this talk will be about. Uh, so hopefully, um, we, you will get out of this session with the feeling that things are going to get much, much better. So first of all, just a word about me. My name is Michael Figuier. Uh, I work for Dastax. I'm responsible for uh, the drivers and all the developer tools at Dastax. And I'm French, which explains this accent that you will have to support for 50 minutes or so. Uh, so if you like what I say, you can follow me on Twitter and hear more about drivers and yes. all the stuff about it. So a huge thing, I was talking about developer experience, a very huge thing uh, to me in the customer space is the introduction of the customer query language. Up to now, I think that I've I heard a lot of feedbacks about Casanova from a bunch of users for a lot of people and very few of them could, and actually none of them, have never criticized uh, Casanova architecture or said that it wasn't a very robust and efficient piece of engineering. And indeed, I really think it is. But probably the number one critic that I can hear uh, for Casanova is probably that it's a little complex and slightly too complicated to learn. That's nicely said, right? Uh, so, and that's true. I mean, uh, it has been very innovative. Uh, it was a very new, uh, a very new way of thinking. So everybody was learning, including us, including uh, the entire NoSQL community. So that's new stuff, and things improve slowly. But now that the, the product actually uh, become much more mature and now that it starts to get used by a much, much broader audience, it's, it's definitely time to make it way simpler to use and way more productive. So that's actually what CQL is all about. So CQL3, uh, and I will give you a very quick introduction to CQL3 because I bet that uh, while most of you guys are familiar with Casanova, uh, probably n not all of you guys are familiar with CQL3. So it's all about uh, manipulating some simple uh, statically defined table, just like uh, you know, uh, just like those you can use in SQL, just as Jonathan could uh, present you this morning. And it's really also about introducing a new query language in order to have a consistent experience across all language, across uh, any programming language, across any uh, administrator shell, you know, uh, that is you've got this SQL SH where you can uh, send the exact same query as the one you can uh, send in a programming language. And that's obviously a great feature because that's a consistent experience across any environment. And that's probably where, why the SQL language is actually uh, such popular, so popular. It's actually uh, because it's just a consistent experience and you don't have to figure out uh, how to express this or that concept in this or that programming language. 
So CQR3 is statically defined, so it, uh, it's, not, it's no more schemaless. So that's a thing. Uh, some people don't really feel comfortable about it, but just think about the fact that whenever uh, you've got a schemaless database, uh, actually most of the time you, you've got a schema. It's just that the definition is stored in your programming language. Uh, the schema is written in Java, in Python, in Wiver, but your application is somewhat aware of uh, the schema of the way you store your data in your database, even if you believe there's no schema. So we don't really feel that it's a, a huge pain point. Besides that, a huge impediment in the Carson world was Swift. Uh, Swift has been a huge opportunity for Carson world at first because uh, it has offered us a lot of drivers for a bunch of language for free, you know. Uh, we had this ideal, this uh, interface definition language uh, for, uh, for Swift and as soon as the Swift community could come with some driver for, uh, with some implementation for a new programming language, we had a driver for that programming language, which is great for a new cover in the database world. But now uh, that Carson has moved forward, it turns out that Swift got some limitation. Uh, it's an RPC. It's an RPC framework, so that means any interaction we can have with the database must be must follow the request response paradigm. That's fairly limited. Um, we cannot send any notification, for instance. Uh, the new protocol we we've introduced in Casm 1.2, and that's the whole point of uh, of this slide is actually. Uh, fully designed for the needs of Casanova, so it's no more an RPC uh, only protocol. You've got everything you need. It opens a lot of doors for a lot of uh, uh, different kind of interaction between, uh, between the server, the client. Uh, we will be able to introduce some streaming. Uh, we will be able to, and we already have some notification, and I will talk about, you about it later. Uh, so it's fully, it's specialized for our, for our uh, needs and it's no more generic. So let's dig a bit more in CQL3. CQL3, as I've mentioned, is just a set of statically defined table. So just think about the table you've got in SQL, that's exactly the same, the only difference is that you don't have any join. So in practice, you don't have this comma in the, uh, in, in uh, the form clauses of your uh, query language in its grammar, you know. So uh, you don't have any join, you don't have any aggregation, uh, you, uh, and you've got a fairly limiting uh, set of where clauses. So that's the point, but besides that, you still manipulate and you still can leverage all the knowledge you've got with this uh, query language, which is great for newcomers. And, uh, that's the world point. So let's have a look at an example. So in this example, we try to store some tweets. Um, so you can recognize here uh, what you would actually store in an SQL database if you were uh, trying to store something f somewhat denormalized. Or maybe that could be uh, something that you could see in a result set from a query in MySQL, you know? Uh, that is, you've got, uh, for, a for a given user, you've got several tweets that are stored along with all their details, you know, auto and body and so on. Uh, so here in this example, we will actually define the user ID as a partition key for our schema. Uh, and then we will define some other column as clustering key. The clustering key in, uh, in SQL3 is actually how you tell Casson, how you tell Casson storage engine how to group, how to cluster data together on the disk. Because that's uh, the concept you're used to in, in Casson and that's the way we express it here. So I will uh, come right after on uh, on the link between this data model and the actual physical data model, which is the one you're familiar with. Uh, but first of all, let's have a look at uh, uh, 
the CQL statement that you would use to create this schema. So you can see that obviously it's fairly familiar. Uh, an interesting point is that here you can see that the first, uh, the first item in your primary key statement is a partition key and the following is following ones with an S because you can have several ones uh, can, uh, are your clustering keys. So uh, this way you can express how you want to partition your data and then how you want to cluster them together on this particular instance. So that's simply several level of aggregation, you know. Uh, first you say how to aggregate on a single machine and then you say how to ag aggregate uh, on the disk. So here is actually how uh, it will be represented uh, on the Zood in the good old classic uh, Cassandra model that is based on uh, some current families. So the trick here is that we basically use the clustering key to group together all the columns and to perform all these clusterings that I, have, I was mentioning. Uh, so you can definitely see that CQL Swiss nothing more than a very simple uh, abstraction layer on top of uh, the storage engine you're familiar with. It's nothing else. Uh, it doesn't really prevent you from uh, keeping the control over the low level details of your, uh, of your storage details because you, you can still fully control how data are uh, grouped together and so on. But uh, it's way simpler to use and way simpler to think about it for developers. Uh, you just think about some tables. If you need to do some join because you cannot do them, you simply duplicate the data over several tables and then uh, you just have to think about how you organize the data together within a table. So that's it for SQL 3. Um, I can take questions about them at the end of the talk, uh, except if someone really doesn't understand anything about it now. OK, awesome. So let's move forward with um, some more client side details. So that's the driver architecture you're familiar with. Uh, all Swift, all based on Swift. And uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with all these Swift details. Maybe some of you just uh, play with uh, the high level client and don't we, uh, uh, and I haven't digged into some details of the underlying details. But uh, basically, the way it works is that. Uh, uh, you, you've got this Swift layer, uh, Cassandra define an IDL, and then Swift is able to generate a client for every programming language. But then, uh, as any kind of generated code, uh, you don't have a great API with it, right? It's not really awesome, it's not really pleasant to use. So that's why the community came with some higher level clients on top of Swift in order to make it uh, way more productive and way more pleasant to use. So they came with uh, some higher level Swift API with some object oriented API. That's uh, for instance the object mapper uh, from Hector that you can find. Uh, Astian has got one as well. And you can find some for Python and so on. Uh, and they also have some SQL uh, 2 or SQL 3 even API also because it's also possible to perform, to play with SQL 3 on top of Swift. Uh, you've got some uh, API core for that. And besides that, you've probably noticed some drivers uh, that were uh, stored and that were all available on google.com slash Apache Extras. Uh, maybe some of you guys have uh, noticed them. Uh, there were some experimentations that have been done at the very beginning of SQL 3 because we've got this tabular uh, data model that actually fits in most standard DB API of any programming language. So we wanted to leverage that in order to have a JDBC standard API, uh, which was a very nice way to integrate with a bunch of things. That was a very interesting experimentation, and this whole architecture uh, in some way was very interesting. So we grouped all that together uh, into this architecture, uh, and that's the one we will try to promote 
uh, for this uh, for the Cassandra world for this next generation Cassandra world. And a very important point here is that it while we prepare for the future with all this thing, uh, all the API and clients that you currently use are still fully compatible with Cassandra Lambda 2, will still be fully compatible with Cassandra 2.0 and so on. So that's a very important point. Uh, all your investments are safe, but besides that, we continue to uh, prepare and invest for the future. And this architecture is based on uh, this new protocol I've mentioned. Uh, which uh, got a bunch of features uh, that I will mention later. Uh, we've got this, uh, what I call DB, standard DB API, which is uh, this JDBC thing that's, uh, uh, for instance, in the Java space, that's uh, a, can, a kind of API that we will try to have on top of all this architecture because that's still convenient to have for some integration. Obviously, that's probably not what you want to use in production. Uh, then you've got this pure uh, dedicated SQL API that is fully designed for SQL 3 and all its features, uh, which might not all fit in this standard DB API, you know. And of course, we keep this object-oriented uh, thing because uh, that's part of the productivity thing for any modern program language. So, the Java drivers that we've started to, uh, to develop at DASTAX uh, come with uh, a bunch of features. Uh, we consider it as, as a reference implementation for, uh, for this architecture and for the new uh, binary protocol because uh, it has been developed cl very closely with the Apache team. Uh, so basically, every, uh, it implements absolutely every feature of the new protocol. And, uh, uh, the protocol has been designed closely with uh, the implementers of this language, of these drivers. So it's, uh, it's based on an AT. Uh, any of you guys that are uh, familiar with the Java world probably uh, know an AT. It's basically a, a, a very convenient uh, an IO framework that uh, gives you uh, some very scalable architecture, asynchronous architecture, uh, to, to develop either some clients or servers. Um, it supports prepper statement uh, because CQL already got prepper statement, which allow you to obviously to still perform uh, uh, despite you use a text language. It supports automatic failover and not discovery. I will talk about this later. Uh, it supports also the new tracing features that uh, Jonathan mentioned this morning. Uh, you might remember about it. It's pretty convenient for to debug uh, your production environment or your developing developer environment. And then you've got a bunch of policies uh, somewhat inspired by the work that has been done by uh, Astianax uh, in Netflix, at Netflix, which was very inspiring for, for this driver. Um, so let's talk about some details about the driver, about the protocol uh, itself. So one one very interesting features, uh, which uh, and you will see there are several of them that uh, to me justify the fact uh, the idea to switch from Swift to this new protocol. What very uh, very interesting features is uh, is that it supports request pipelining. Request pipelining is actually the idea to be able to send a bunch of requests without waiting for any answers. You just send some requests along with uh, an ID to identify this, uh, these queries, and then you wait for answers that might come later, at some later point. Um, so a very interesting uh, thing in this architecture is that it allows you to send a bunch of requests uh, without uh, blocking a connection just, uh, just because you've got uh, a request that is a bit slow or a node that is a bit slow or whatever. Uh, so very interesting thing, especially for Casewa, <coughs> which start to have some very large deployment, you know, with, we already have some uh, cluster in the Androids. Uh, so you can imagine that if you've got some cluster in the Androids, uh, typically you might have several Androids application server as well uh, in front of it. Uh, the maximum default amount of connection per node in Hector is 50 connection. Uh, so do the math and you realize that start to be nasty to maintain. 
Uh, so that's a very convenient way to scale the amount of connection in a more with, much more reasonable way. And that's also a very convenient way to, to uh, perform some kind of multi-gates uh, without having to actually say so. I mean, if you just send a bunch of requests, uh, because you don't have to wait for the, the actual answer, uh, you still perform very well, because uh, this bunch of requests just uh, looks a lot like the actual uh, queries for a batch, you know, so uh, that's a very convenient way to use your connection uh, at its max, uh, all, all the boundary for, of your connection without uh, being killed by any latency issues. Uh, so definitely great for Casino and it also allows us to have a fully asynchronous architecture and I will mention it later. Notification. I've mentioned it earlier in, in this talk, uh, this new protocol support notification. It's not meant for any business purpose, uh, so don't understand me wrong. Here we're not talking about uh, receive some notification whenever some data change in Casmo or anything like that. It's purely technical. Uh, it, uh, the point is to receive uh, some updates from Casmo whenever a node has been added or removed so that the client can update their load balancing policies or their, their strategy, you know, because currently the typical strategy is that clients will try to pull all this, uh, not all, but uh, will try to pull the servers, uh, a customer nodes, to, to retrieve periodically an updated uh, list of nodes and an updated uh, topology. And that's obviously not very satisfying architecture. So with Swift, it was obviously the only way to go, but here, as we own our protocol, as we, uh, we make our own rules with this protocol, we can, that's a very simple thing for us to implement. So, uh, what actually happened is that you will have a client that will uh, choose, pick up a node, and uh, will register uh, for some events with this node, and then you will receive some notification with uh, some updates about the topology or schemas or whatever. So very interesting for uh, drivers internals and probably as well for some ops perspective. So I was talking about this asynchronous architecture. Basically, um, in a very scalable architecture, it's very convenient, it's very common for you to have some needs to uh, send several requests in parallel. Uh, it's also uh, very common for you to have a bunch of, uh, of client threads talking to the driver uh, and uh, actually performing some requests themselves in parallel. So because our new driver comes with a fully asynchronous architecture and with some fully non-blocking IOs, thanks to th this uh, Netty IO implementation, that allows us to have a very nice way to implement all that. Basically here, what will happen is that a client thread will send a request to the driver. The driver will dispatch it according to a load balancing policy. I will mention it right after. Uh, will dispatch it uh, according to the load balancing policy to any node and then will pick up the least used connection for this node. It will send the request to the node the node will answer. Uh, while, while the request is processed, the thread will be uh, typically blocked, but internally in the driver, there's a node thread that is used or no blocking connection or no blocking I.O. or whatever. The driver is still free. Maybe as the, as the client said, we'll actually not block. Maybe it will just perform some other asynchronous operation um, during this uh, request processing. Then the answer will come from uh, the Gaston node. Uh, the driver will then dispatch it to, uh, to the white thread waiting for, for the answer, and we are good to go. So this architecture, I'm w definitely not here uh, trying to move forward to, to try to uh, resource the good old debate blocking versus non-blocking and asynchronous versus a no, uh, synchronous, but it's just that it simplifies your life here 
in a very scalable environment uh, because you don't have to maintain any sweat pools, you don't have to maintain any queues or things like that. Uh, you do, just have to care about the amount of connections that you want to keep open or the maximum amount of connection per node, which is way simpler for you to configure and maintain. So I was mentioning these load balancing policies. Uh, in this new driver, uh, and that's, so during this whole uh, presentation, I actually used Java, but uh, you will find some similar concept in pretty much every language uh, for which we will try to implement or, or collaborate to implement some uh, uh, this kind of driver architecture. So uh, don't worry if uh, you don't actually use Java uh, every day. So the kind of policies you will have to implement if you want to very finely customize the way the driver will behave with your architecture is this kind of uh, load balancing policy. Everybody in this room might have in production some very different kind of topology. You know, some of you, some of you guys might have 10 data centers, some other might have just two or three like West Coast, East Coast, Europe. Um, and maybe some other might just have one data center and just a, 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 few, a few nodes. So obviously, some very different load balancing policies uh, might fit your needs. And maybe uh, you might have some cluster uh, locally, you might have an, uh, another one uh, on EC2. Uh, for some cost strategy, you might want to send as few requests as possible on the EC2 cluster and uh, more on the local one. That's where you can totally tweak these kind of things. Uh, so it's fairly flexible. All you've got to do is to implement this interface, which uh, will be able to say the driver, okay, for this, this host is actually at this distance for me. Distance is just uh, local or remote or unknown. Uh, and then uh, for a given query object, you will just have to be able to, uh, to give the driver a list of, uh, uh, of hosts. Uh, an iterator of hosts that is, uh, if the first one is not available, then the driver will, uh, will try the second one and so on and so forth. So um, we have made it as simple as possible for you guys to implement so that uh, don't hesitate to implement it to fit exactly your needs. But obviously, uh, because a lot of deployments are still pretty similar also, um, we come with some default, uh, with some built-in implementation. Uh, so obviously you've got a one robin policy, that's pretty basic, but you've got also some more interesting one like a DC aware one robin policy which allow you to, uh, to, to, to say to the driver, okay, uh, uh, you are in this data center, uh, so I want you to try to send every request to nodes that are local, and if they are not available, well, just uh, push them to uh, the other data center. Um, we also support some token-aware policies, that's something that has been introduced with Astinax, uh, and it's very interesting, especially if your cluster is very large. The idea here is simply, uh, to give some awareness of the token uh, topology of the cluster so that uh, the client is able to route, uh, to choose a coordinator that is actually a replica for the query uh, that is being processed. So the interesting part here is that it, uh, it gives you um, some performance boost uh, and some uh, ensuring the latency in some case, uh, which might be interesting for some application. Uh, here it will still be best default because the driver is not aware of, uh, of the actual uh, SQL grammar, so uh, you will either have to provide it or use some higher level API that will uh, just infer this, uh, this token for you. But still, uh, you've got this availability, and a very interesting thing is that these policies are actually implemented as a filter, so that you can just wrap your own customized uh, load balancing policy and add some token, token awareness on, on top of that. So that's pretty convenient, so that you can still be customized and uh, fully IT performance. 
Another very interesting concept is the we-try policy. So the idea of the we-try policy is just to, uh, to tell the driver what to do when a, uh, when a request could not complete successfully. So there are several reasons for a request not to complete successfully. Maybe you will have uh, on the coordinator node, the coordinator node will not receive uh, response on time to complete the request. So it will be some time out, either some weed or white, depending on the kind of the request. It can also be uh, simply that the coordinator knows that not enough nodes are available, in which case it will be an unavailable exception. Depending on this case, you will implement some different kind of behavior and a uh, retry policy. So here you will just have to, implement, to uh, provide a decision which might be either to retry, either to re-throw the exception, or just to ignore silently all the error. And that's very interesting because you can implement uh, outside your business logic these very common uh, technical things that are retries, you know? Maybe in most of your application you don't care about retries and you will actually just move on. Um, if, an, if you've got an error, you will have an error page and that will be fine for you. But for some applications, that's not good enough. Uh, for some applications, you will uh, really badly need uh, the thing to complete even if the customer cluster doesn't feel very well. So a good reason for the customer cluster to not feel very well and for this uh, kind of error to, to arise might be simply that uh, you've lost too much replicas. You know, maybe you wanted to perform a query with a core consistency level, either at read or write time, and you couldn't complete it, for instance, because uh, you were missing two replicas out of three. So in such a situation, you know that uh, the query will not complete successfully, and what, uh, what we allow you to do is uh, uh, and we provide you uh, a built-in retry policy for that is to downgrade the consistency if you want to do so. That is, if for some business logic purpose, for business requirement purpose, you've, uh, you've chosen to, uh, to perform your request with a quorum consistency level, then you will have the ability to uh, complete the request with consistency level one and be notified that uh, in the result set uh, that the query could not complete at, at the current consistency level. And that's interesting in some business situation where you actually uh, cannot afford to, uh, to answer an error page maybe to, to some customers because that's a fairly critical service. So you might just uh, give a consistency, uh, perform it with consistency level one and maybe show some uh, warning to your user or log some uh, message in your, in your application server logs or something like that. But at least you won't be dead, which is fairly interesting, I think. So that's it for these policies. Um, I'd like to move on with, yeah. Question about policies. Yeah. Um, so based on the kind of policies selected, will the client actually keep multiple TCP connections open uh, in the sense a TCP connection per host that's provided to it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, the question was about the amount of, uh, of uh, connection per host that are maintained. And actually, this concept is out of uh, these retry policies. It's in something I haven't mentioned it because it's not, uh, it's not that important, uh, at least le uh, less than this one. It's, uh, you've got also reconnection policies. Uh, so here, you, we don't expect you to actually want to implement some very exotic one. We just provide you a, a constant reconnection policy or an, uh, a logarithmic uh, uh, reconnection policy, which is basically, you know, a very classic thing. You want to try to reconnect either every n seconds or you want to reconnect every two seconds and every four seconds and every eight seconds and so on and so forth. So that's fairly classic. Um, that's provided for you. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah okay. It's fine for everyone?
Okay, so uh, I've presented to you this whole architecture, and uh, so maybe that seems interesting for you, but uh, let's be more practical. Uh, let's talk about the actual API. That's the Java API that uh, you can find some, uh, some equivalent for C Sharp, and uh, we work together with the community to, uh, to, to provide something similar for some other language. So here, we've really, really wanted to have something uh, very uh, productive, uh, very not variables, and very efficient. So we provide you a builder uh, to build your cluster. Uh, very typical, you provide uh, several contact points that will uh, uh, that will be used as a seed, you know, for uh, for the client to discover some nodes. So the client will try to connect to either of these nodes. Uh, you typically provide several for uh, for high availability at, at boot swap and. The driver will be able to discover every node because it will retrieve the topology uh, through some request to, uh, to this uh, contact point. So all you need is to provide a few nodes and the driver will do the rest for you. Then you connect, uh, you connect to this uh, cluster, actually your key space, and you obtain this session object that is fully thread safe. You don't have to uh, care about anything, you can inject it in every place in your application and you don't have to care about anything. You can simply execute some statement using this execute method and um, yeah, you're good to go. If it's a wide, you don't even care about the result set maybe, so uh, you're done. So I really think it's a huge improvement compared to some past uh, implementation. <coughs> For the read, um, you will execute uh, a read statement. You will get a result set. Uh, this result set actually implements iterable in Java, but you will be able to, uh, to wait with a list of rows, uh, and then you will just uh, iterate over this list of rows. So once again, uh, fairly classical and fairly readable for any Java developer, I bet. But the interesting point is that we've got asynchronous read. So we are able to perform uh, the same kind of request uh, with some asynchronous architecture, in some asynchronous way. So here you will just receive a future object. Uh, this future object uh, will be uh, uh, like a ticket for you to get uh, the upcoming answer, so it's exactly like the ticket you've got when you uh, push an order at your local burger restaurant and you wait for your burger to be cooked. Yeah, I try to integrate in American or something. Uh, so uh, that's exactly uh, what the future object is actually in, in, the Java, uh, in the Java programming language if you're not familiar with it. So you've got this future object and you can send several requests in parallel. Okay, uh, so that's very interesting because once again you don't have any sweat pool uh, uh, besides it, you don't have any sweat pool to maintain, uh, it's all done for you in some asynchronous way. So then once the future is ready, you can simply intuit over everything. I've mentioned prepare statements. We've got prepare statements already available and that's where uh, that's a very important feature for um, a query language that actually use some strings. Because strings, obviously, are much less efficient than Swift. I mean, uh, Swift is, st is still binary. So you know, we need to send all these queries as string to the server. And it's not very, very uh, efficient, obviously. But thanks to prepare statement, I mean, uh, same same architecture, same solution to the same problem as in the SQL world. So we use prepare statement. A difference, uh, we have uh, some classical APIs such as JetBC. Here is that uh, the prepare statement object that you will obtain when you prepare a statement is thread safe. So you can share it uh, among all your threads and then you will bind it 
uh, with, uh, with some parameters and you will obtain a bound statement. So you can either uh, set all your parameters uh, at bad bind time or you can set them slightly later uh, by setting every parameter one by one depending on some sh uh, on the kind of short shortcut you're willing to use or not. So here you will obtain this bound statement that will just be valid for the context of your request. Uh, you will set all your parameters and you will then execute them. So once again, I guess it's fairly uh, compact and productive API uh, considering all the work that is done here. We've got a query builder also. Mm -hmm. Because once again, same architecture, same problems, same solutions. Uh, when you've got a text-based query language, you might have some SQL injection, right? So, because obviously we don't want this to happen. Uh, whenever you need to craft some query at runtime, uh, you should use this query language that actually uh, does the work properly for you. So you can simply use this uh, very convenient uh, Fluent API that will allow you to dynamically craft some uh, queries, maybe uh, depending on some results of, of, of some form, you know, submitted by the users or something like that. That's some fairly typical use cases for some uh, for a query builder. Or maybe even uh, you don't like to put some strings in your program language and you prefer to have this uh, uh, type safe uh, Fluent API, so maybe that, uh, that might be something that you prefer to use. In any case, here you could use this, uh, this query builder and you can also use it to, to craft some queries for some prepare statement actually. So fairly productive, I guess. Oops. We've got object mapping as well. Uh, this object mapping, uh, is not falling fully, so once again here in, uh, in, the, in the case of this jar driver, is not fully uh, following the, J, the standard JPA interface uh, because we don't want to be trapped in a standard relational oriented API which doesn't allow us to put any kind of uh, uh, uncommon features that you may, may find in the relational world. We want to be free to extend uh, Carson as much as we want and already now you've got some features that will not fit very well in JPA. So we want to follow as much as possible JPA because once again there's no reason for developers to uh, relearn everything, something totally different for every, uh, for every database they, they, they get familiar with but uh, we want to still be free from it. So here you will define simply with uh, a table annotation, the, the actual name of the table in, uh, in Casanova. You will uh, define which is your partition key, which uh, field is your partition key, uh, thanks to uh, the partition key annotation. Uh, if the column name doesn't match, uh, the one you use in the programming language, maybe because of some underscore, you might want to use this at current annotation. Um, interesting, in interestingly here, all this uh, object mapping, all this uh, object mapping is actually not an equivalent to ORM, you know, it's, uh, it's not meant to simulate an object database on top of uh, Casanova like most ORM are actually doing. Uh, but here we just try to map uh, some object to queries and some result set to object, you know. So that's all we, all we do simply to uh, allow you to be productive uh, and, and to provide you something convenient whenever you program some real world business application where you might have tens and hundreds of current because uh, some business logic for some business are fairly complex sometimes. So uh, here you, uh, you actually don't really have, because of that, to provide the partition key. It's optional, but you might want to provide it so that we will be able to craft some DDL for you, uh, which might be fairly convenient, you know, if you're uh, trying uh, to do some, uh, some proof of concept, you know, you might just 
white Java object and you, we will be able to create uh, the SQL schema for you, which is pretty cool, I think, when you want to move forward fast. Um, because we are in Java um, and because we are performing, we are trying to build this mapping module, uh, we can provide you some Inuit. Uh, it's not something new, some other uh, mapping framework on top of Casanova also do it. But this Inuit is simply based on, uh, on uh, this community of colon. So we, you will just specify which colon to use uh, for the discriminator, and then in each subclass you will specify what is the actual value. So this any returns is just uh, a way to map, to map type to column and column to type, right? So that's all I've got about this new driver. So the good news is that some betas are already available at github.com slash dastacks. There are some DASTAX products, but they're all open source and they will remain open source. Uh, so you can debug or add the source or extend or submit some patch or whatever you want. Uh, it's Apache 2 license, so it's fully compatible with any Apache project or most of open source projects. Uh, or, and it's business friendly, of course. So we've got better, uh, better uh, Beta Java driver available, uh, that's the one I've printed here. We've got a C Sharp driver available on this account as well, and we're working currently on some other language uh, to support some other language, and we will work together with the community to support an extended list of language. Yes? Uh, so I don't have a plan for every single language, uh, but so all I can tell you right now is that our goal is clearly to push this kind of architecture for every possible language and especially for the mainstream one. So uh, I don't have an answer for you right now, but uh, I can tell you that we really want basically to see something up, uh, to, to see something similar for the PHP world. So either done by Dastax or by the community, we will work together uh, closely in order to see that happen. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's clearly uh, a lo the long-term client architecture that we would like to see uh, for most programming language uh, because we believe, uh, we've thought about it with a lot of care, that feedbacks are fully welcome. If you believe something is wrong or if you believe something is missing, feel free to contact me. Uh, even if you really, really think it's bad, still into in that. Uh, so we just want the idea with, uh, with uh, this project is just to provide a consistent architecture across every language. So the very interesting part here is that you've seen these policies. What we are doing is that we standardize these policies across, uh, well in this case Java and C Sharp for now, but soon across some more language. So from a developer standpoint, that means that uh, the very custom uh, load balancing policies that you implement in one language, you can uh, very simply port them in some other language because the API will be so similar, you know. And from an ops perspective, it's, it means that uh, they no longer have to figure out, you know, oh, okay, so this uh, application actually use Hector and this one use PyCasa so I think that the load balancing strategy is this one but uh, I think that this driver is slightly more smart and do some wheat wise but I'm not sure oh god uh, would yeah so you got it so uh, here what we try to do is to uh, include the client uh, in the whole arch in the whole distributed architecture of Casanova and make it a whole consistent uh, thing and no more just a, a set of, uh, you know, uh, ser service providers, service consumers that just like it used to be. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, on which version of Casanova can you expect to use uh, this? Uh, so because it uh, relies on uh, the 
new binary protocol, uh, you will actually uh, have to use CAS 1.2 because it has been introduced in CAS 1.2. So anything uh, after CAS 1.2, yeah. Uh, do you have Yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's something we will provide as well. Uh, we are currently writing some uh, driver implementation guide, you know, f to work closely with the community so that we can see some driver happen where we cannot make it. Yeah, so come to talk to me if you're interested. <coughs> yeah. Uh, back, right? So one of the things with Accenture that we do is, you know, yeah. Uh, so the question was about batch. Uh, so batch are supported directly in the CQL language. So you can provide some batch uh, uh, statement directly in the execute method. You know it will work. Uh, we've got a batch object also available in our query builder, and uh, everything in this driver is actually a query object. So. Uh, you will quickly realize that a batch is still a query and you can put some queries in batch and that's pretty convenient. Yeah. What was the question? Well, uh, it's time for me to go, but I will be available around if you've got any other question. Okay. Thank you.